Welcome, everyone, to the Canadian Concussion Center's webinar series sponsored by the Laborers International Union of North America, or LIUNA. My name is Charles Tatter. I'm the director of the Canadian Concussion Center. I've been involved in concussion treatment and research for about two decades now. And I'm very pleased to be moderating our webinar uh, tonight. Um, this is targeted towards people who have actually suffered a concussion and their caregivers and healthcare providers. These sessions recur every other week, uh, live on Tuesday evenings from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. The sessions are recorded, and so they're available for your subsequent viewing, all on the CCC website, which is uh, Canadian Concussion Center, uhn.ca. Each of our sessions focuses on various aspects of concussion and include an expert speaker presentation for the first half followed by question and answer period for the second half. We'd ask you uh, when you have a question to put it in the Q&A section and not in the chat. And you'll see the Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen in the Zoom webinar application. And, and once uh, you press that application, a window will open so that you can submit your question. If you have any technical questions, though, please put these into the chat. Also, please note that you will find links to tonight's presentation, as well as the link to the CCC webpage, where you will find videos of our previous webinars in the chat section, as I've previously recommended. So just prior to getting started this evening, we would like to run a very quick poll. And Christian, please put up the uh, questions and then we'll wait a few seconds for people to respond and then we'll move on. Okay, I think we can now proceed. Um, Christian has put up a reminder of upcoming sessions every other Tuesday at uh, this time. So please take advantage of uh, these experts who will be speaking in subsequent sessions. For tonight's session, I'm so pleased to be the moderator because I'm introducing Leslie Rattan, who has been the moderator for all the previous sessions that many of you will have watched. And just speaking about the previous sessions, we just heard today that there are now people in about 25 countries, in addition to Canada, who watch these uh, webinars. So concussion is a pretty important problem. Uh, also, just recently, I've seen statistics that there are now, there's now evidence that about 1% of the population is concussed each year. So in Canada, with about 40 million people, that's about uh, 400,000 concussions a year. So that's incredible. And we're, we're here to try to make you better. Dr. Leslie Rattan, our speaker tonight, is a registered psychologist practicing in the areas of clinical neuropsychology and clinical psychology. She has been a part-time staff member, neuropsychologist at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute at UHN since 2002. She worked with inpatients and outpatients with a wide range of acquired brain injuries and we're so pleased that she's now focusing on concussion with the Canadian Concussion Center. And she's been doing that since 2014. 
assisting in the development of and delivery of concussion education and support, like what we're doing tonight, in fact. And she is one of the originators of this entire series that has gone on now for several years. She has served as practice leader for psychology at TRI, UHN, and has been actively involved in the training of clinical residents and practicum students. And she also maintains a private practice. So she's very busy, but fortunately she's very committed to this series. And it's just so wonderful that uh, this has been so helpful. And Leslie has been a great moderator. And tonight she is your speaker. And uh, please save up your questions until uh, the end, and then we'll be very pleased to try and answer as many of them as possible. So, Dr. Rattan, please proceed. Thank you very much, Dr. Tatter. I hope every can, everyone can hear me okay. Uh, thanks for joining tonight, and I'm hoping that the, there we go. Uh, so, we heard from, uh, if you were with us two weeks ago, Dr. Snyderman was here, uh, who is a neuropsychologist neuropsychiatrist at Toronto Rehab, and he started out our discussion on mental health, and he's actually going to be back in another two weeks talking more about that. Um, just as in terms of conflicts of interest, none uh, to name here. So I just wanted to provide a bit of an outline in terms of what I'm going to be covering tonight. So starting off with just talking about mental health and concussion, uh, talking about why it's so important in the cycle of prolonged symptoms, uh, and then moving into managing mental health and talking about uh, a variety of ways that, uh, that you can do that. So as we heard from Dr. Snyderman, mental health difficulties are really common uh, after concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, which is the MTBI. And they really appear to be major determinants in how well people do post-injury. Uh, you can see right there, uh, the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation has put out guidelines. Those are the most recent uh, version. Um, those are the guidelines, that are, that's the version for healthcare practitioners. There is also uh, a version for patients and all of those, uh, you'll find all of these references at the end of the presentation and in the link that uh, Christian provided in the chat. Uh, so we know that there's a wide range of, of difficulties that can follow concussion, things like anxiety, depression, irritability and anger, emotional dysregulation, that is having large ups and downs in terms of mood, uh, substance abuse, post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on how the injury may have been sustained. Uh, and that's, you know, amongst, amongst others. And there's a real range in, as well in terms of uh, the severity of symptoms. So some people may only have a few symptoms, whereas others may have more significant symptoms and actually meet diagnostic criteria for uh, a mental health disorder, uh, as Dr. Snyderman had referred to. So the question is always, you know, where do these mental health difficulties come from uh, after concussion? And it's, it's complicated. It's, it's not a simple uh, thing. On the one hand, we know that when you've had a concussion, you've had an injury to the brain. And our brain, of course, controls everything that we do. Uh, including our, our emotions, our moods, our behaviors. So there's a possibility that uh, the, the injury itself can uh, have an Im direct impact on, on mood and emotions. Um, there's also more reactive environmental causes. So you can imagine if someone has sustained a traumatic injury, for example, uh, that can be very emotionally distressing. People can have symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Uh, people can uh, have other symptoms outside of mental health symptoms, such as difficulties with their cognition, for example, difficulty with thinking. And that in turn has effects on things like ability to resume their pre-injury level of functioning and activities, maybe such as going back to work. Uh, that in, in turn, of course, can cause a lot of stress and then lead to mental health difficulties. And then there's just the stress of having 
symptoms such as fatigue or, or pain. When you're uh, walking around, for example, with a headache all the time, it's pretty understandable that over time that would get very frustrating. So in terms of the current guidelines, the current ONF guidelines, these are really meant to guide healthcare practitioners in terms of how to treat different symptoms of post-concussion. And there's a, a section in there that's specific to mental health disorders. And basically we want to treat symptoms if they're causing any kind of distress, if they're impacting on functioning, uh, on quality, quality of life, or if they're interfering with recovery. And you can see um, on the, um, uh, this is just a screenshot from, from the actual guideline and with the red arrow pointing to non-pharmacological treatment of mental health disorders. So these are the strategies, the treatments that don't involve medication. And that's what I'm gonna be focusing on tonight. The pharmacological treatment is what Dr. Snyderman is gonna be returning to talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, so in terms of these, you know, you may get recommendations from your primary care providers, family physicians, psychologists, other mental health specialists. So psychological interventions, the non-pharmacological, are really critical in managing primary mental health disorders. Um, there are many different types of talk therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the one that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, about tonight. The reason being it is the most well uh, researched type of talk therapy. So we have a lot of evidence, including studies that have looked at cognitive behavioral therapy with individuals with concussion and, and more significant brain injury and have found uh, benefit. There, there's really been strong support for CBT across multiple health conditions, including those affecting concussed individuals. It was originally developed for depression many decades ago, uh, but they have found that it, it can be helpful for many um, different uh, uh, issues. And just adding that, that oftentimes combined treatment with medication may also be appropriate depending on the severity of, of the symptoms. So why do we wanna pay attention to mental health? Why is it so important? And, and what is this cycle of, of prolonged symptoms? So when someone suffers a concussion, you can see, again, this is a brain injury. So our brain controls everything about us. So you can see symptoms that range across physical, cognitive, and emotional domains. Um, what the guidelines recommend that providers do, however, is there, there can many, there can be many, many symptoms, but these critical initial targets include pain, sleep, and mood. And the reason why these are highlighted, um, and I think probably everyone watching can relate whether you've had a concussion or not, when we are in pain, when we're not getting restorative sleep, when we are depressed, uh, those issues have the potential to exacerbate uh, or cause a whole host of other symptoms. So for example, uh, in this cycle, you can see here, just as an example, someone has a concussion, they start having headaches. And as a result of the headaches, they're being woken at night, they're not sleeping well. As a result of not sleeping well, they find that they're, they're feeling foggy, they, they can't remember things, they can't focus. Uh, that starts to impact on their daily functioning, whether it's at work or at school, um, that has consequences. And then as a result, you end up with uh, increasing emotional symptoms. And what can happen is it, people can really get stuck in this cycle. And what we want to do is to really try and prevent this cycle from happening and address the symptoms. So what can you do? I think, you know, number one is you, you really want to watch for symptom patterns and triggers. You know, are there certain uh, times of the day where I notice uh, symptoms are worse? Um, are there certain environments that, that are triggering? Uh, and just starting to take note of, of what is happening. Uh, adopting effective self-care and coping strategies is really important as well. And of course, seeking appropriate treatment as needed. So in terms of managing mental health, we always encourage people to start with the basics. And when we say the basics, it, it actually covers a lot of ground. 
Um, I've listed, you know, a number here. There are probably more, but these are definitely really important ones. So as we mentioned, sleep, you know, when we're not getting restorative sleep, we, we don't function well. We don't function well cognitively. Uh, we, our mood is affected. Our behaviors are affected. Uh, nutrition is another important one to pay attention to. You know, what are you feeding your body? Uh, physical exercise, you will hear this over and over throughout the series, the importance of physical exercise. And this isn't just for, um, uh, you know, concussion, but, but for mood specifically as well. We know that physical exercise is one of the best antidepressants that we have. Uh, alcohol and recreational drugs. So making sure, you know, if you're recovering, if you're still symptomatic, you want to be avoiding these things. Social activity, leisure, recreation. This is another really important piece that I think can, can get forgotten. Sometimes after brain injury, after concussion, people are feeling unwell. They don't feel up to socializing or perhaps engaging in the same activities. And there's a real tendency for people to start withdrawing, uh, not be as social, not see people as much. And uh, it really is important to try and maintain some level of interaction with, with people that are supportive and doing some enjoyable activities. Energy conservation and pacing is another one. So it's very often the case post-concussion that people will report that they're very easily fatigued, that it takes a lot more energy to do the same task than it did before. So it becomes really important to take a look at your schedule and make sure that you're, you know, incorporating breaks and probably working a bit differently than you may have before. And then finally, again, with regards to mental health, having a routine, having structure in your day, especially if, you know, it's the case that perhaps you haven't returned to work yet, uh, or you're off school, uh, or you haven't gotten back to all of the usual activities, it's really important to nevertheless schedule things um, in during the day. Uh, there are a lot of resources that, that you can access for sleep. This is just a screenshot of one of the resources from the ONF guidelines. And again, you'll find those uh, in the resource section uh, at the end of this presentation. All of this is freely available online. Uh, and they have a number of different self-help um, sort of tip sheets when it comes to sleep. So some of them may seem very straightforward, but I think it never can hurt if you are having difficulties with sleep to run through this, make sure you're doing all of these things. And if it's still not working to, to seek out help. Nutrition is another one. Um, you know, in terms of the evidence base for specific diets and foods and, and concussion. I don't think we're really there yet, but Baycrest has put out um, what they call a brain health food guide, and this is evidence-based. Uh, so I think this is probably a good place to, to start. And I don't think, again, there'll be any huge surprises, but certainly encouraging people to really avoid processed foods, excess sugar, uh, substances as, as we discussed red meat. So it's, it's really that Mediterranean type style uh, diet, you know, what's good for your heart, good for your brain. Uh, so when you're recovering, it really makes sense, you know, our brain requires uh, a lot of energy and nutrients. So you really want to make sure that you're feeding it properly. Physical exercise, again, we know that, especially when we engage in aerobic exercise, uh, there's a brain um, factor called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which supports the survival and growth and differentiation of, of new neurons and synapses, endorphins are released. So as I said, we know that physical exercise is uh, a great antidepressant. So uh, the other thing with physical exercise that is so great is that there is actual evidence here with concussion, and a lot of work has been done at the University of Buffalo where they have put individuals who are struggling with persistent post-concussive symptoms um, on controlled exercise programs and found that with gradual increasing uh, of the exercise that people recover in terms of their symptoms. So this is really one of the best things that people can do and, and can do fairly soon after concussion uh, on a graduated uh, basis. 
In terms of that pacing and energy con conservation, um, this is uh, an app and there are a number of apps out there. This one was developed in London uh, and it was co-designed by ABI patients and their caregivers. Um, so it's something that you can, uh, it's freely available and it, it helps you to monitor and track your daily activity and concussion symptoms. And you can do it using your computer or uh, laptop. And again, that, that will be in the presentation. I think from a mental health perspective as well, whenever I see um, individuals that are, that are coming in and reporting that they're depressed, it's really important that you see your, your family physician, your primary health care provider, just to make sure that there aren't any treatable, readily treatable causes of, of low mood. So checking things like your thyroid, your B12, your iron, um, considering hormonal changes and that sort of thing. Because uh, of course, if these things are off, you can be doing all kinds of other things, but you might not be getting anywhere. So the next thing uh, that I wanted to talk about was cognitive behavioral therapy. So as I said, this is just one type of therapy, but it is the one that really does have uh, some research evidence behind it. It's described as a goal-oriented short-term psychotherapy. And the idea is really that it teaches us strategies and skills. It focuses on the here and now. Uh, and it's really a collaborative effort between the therapist and the client. And the background of CBT is really the idea that, that psychological problems are based in our, in our thoughts in part on that inner voice that I think we all can probably relate to. And sometimes that inner voice can really not be very helpful. There can be unhelpful ways of thinking. And this is definitely much more the case when individuals start to get depressed or they're anxious. And you, you know, there are also learned patterns of, of unhelpful behavior. And so depending on the way, you know, as per this little um, comic here, the way that we talk to ourselves has a big impact on how we feel. This is what they call the five factor model of CBT. And it's, it's uh, I, I like this because it, it sort of puts into place um, you know, showing that you can see that the big oval basically re reflects our environment. This is our life, what's happening in our life. And, you know, oftentimes we have a lot going on and then you insert a concussion in there and post-concussive symptoms. Uh, that has a big impact on these other four factors within, within the oval. So we have our thoughts. So those are, you know, we all have thousands and thousands of thoughts that run through our head every day. We have moods, so that's our emotions, that's how we're feeling. Our behaviors, which are basically what we do, you know, it's our decision to, you know, get out of bed when the alarm goes off or to, you know, to hit snooze and, and stay there. Uh, and our physical reactions, that's what's happening in our body. And what is most important to take away from this diagram is that all of these things are interconnected. And what that means is they feed back upon one another, and that can happen in a positive way, but it can certainly also happen in a negative way. And as I said, CBT was originally developed for depression um, by, by Aaron Beck, but this book that uh, I have noted here, Mind Over Mood, this uh, is by Greenberger and Podesky. It's called, um, you know, change how you feel by changing the way that you think. And it's, it's kind of like the CBT Bible. It's a, it's a book that anyone can purchase uh, online or in store. Uh, I have no links to them, but it's something that, that we often use with clients. And it's, you know, it's something that you could pick up and work on yourself. And it really starts with this model and, you know, and us starting to recognize that the way that we're thinking about things uh, can really affect how we feel, how we end up behaving, and even our physical reactions. So if you think of, you know, physical reactions in terms of concussion, you might think headache, pain, uh, you might think fatigue, dizziness. So the idea really here is that, you know, the way that we think about all of these things can actually have a direct impact on not only how we feel emotionally, but how we feel physically. In CBT, they refer to um, thought, some of these thoughts as automatic thoughts. And these are thoughts that are generally negative. So again, negative about oneself, about the world, about everything going around on around you, the future. And it's, it's often the case that people aren't fully aware. They're sort of bubbling beneath the surface. Um, but 
especially if you, you know, have these sort of learned patterns, um, oftentimes we just assume that they're true. We assume that, that everything we think uh, is correct. And it's often the case that these automatic thoughts are tied to negative, negative moods. And they label these distorted thoughts as thinking errors or cognitive distortions. So examples include things like catastrophizing. Uh, so that's, you know, imagining the very worst case scenario happening when, um, when you're imagining something all or nothing thinking or black and white thinking. So, you know, I either get perfect or I'm a failure should thinking. So I should do that. I shouldn't have done that and so on. Uh, mind reading. So that's, you know, have you ever experienced that where you, you assume you know what someone else is thinking, perhaps just based on a facial expression, uh, only to learn later that you were, you were kind of off base and, and you misinterpreted. So the bottom line there is kind of don't believe everything you think. You know, it's not to say that all of our thoughts are errors. Of course, they're not. Um, but it's good to sort of be aware, especially when we have negative emotion present, when you notice yourself feeling down, angry, frustrated, uh, to, to, though that's the time to really take a look at your thoughts to see, it, you know, is it possible that anything that I'm thinking about could be a distortion? So when you're doing CBT, you know, part of it is learning to recognize when you make thinking errors and to try and challenge them. Um, as I say, you can do this on your own. You can do it with a therapist. Um, also using problem sol solving skills to cope with difficult situations. So perhaps you notice that, you know, there's sort of some negative mood and you look at your thinking and maybe your thinking is quite accurate. You know, maybe this is a, a difficult time. Well, that's a time where, you know, you may not be adjusting your thinking. It may be trying to come up, you know, come up with a bit of an action plan and, and to solve what, what's happening. Also, behavioral strategies are, are a really important piece of this. So um, if you haven't noticed, generally speaking, when, uh, when we're anxious, uh, when there's something, um, you know, that we're worried about, our natural tendency is to avoid those things. We, we try and push them away, we put them off, we procrastinate. And unfortunately, what that usually does is just perpetuate the anxiety. And we, we feel like we've solved something in the short term by avoiding it. But what ends up happening is that anxiety starts, continues to grow. So the better strategy, and again, this can be, this is hard to do on your own. Um, but if you're working with someone, then you can work to actually try and face what the fear is and, and, and expose yourself to that fear on a very gradual basis. Um, but again, that avoidance is, is something that, that generally isn't helpful. Also learning to calm the mind and relax the body is really important. Uh, when I'm working with people, I mean, CBT can be very helpful, but I always say it's not the be all and the end all. It's, it's, it's one piece, I think, of what can be um, a toolbox for someone to use for mental health difficulties. So generally, if you're working with someone, this is done collaboratively, uh, helping to, you know, question your thoughts, identify any cognitive traps, look to identify more balanced alternatives, challenge assumptions that, that may be leading to the automatic thoughts, and then to actually test out those balanced thoughts and alternatives uh, in the real world, where you actually maybe do an experiment. Maybe there's something that you've been afraid to do, and you test it out in a, you know, in a, in a kind of a safe, smaller environment just to see what happens. And oftentimes people do this and then realize, oh, that wasn't actually so bad. I think I can do this. Um, and then, as I was saying, in terms of CBT, there's a lot of different options. Uh, there are self-guided programs, and I've included these at the end. There are group programs that you can participate in. And then, of course, there's always individual psychotherapy um, that, that you can access and you'd want to, to seek out someone who has experience with uh, concussion, experience as well with CBT, uh, and who is a good fit, fit for you. The next thing uh, that I wanted to talk about as well is mindfulness meditation. So this comes, this is a bit more of, you know, calming the mind and soothing the body. 
uh, part. And so I think this, this really um, combines nicely with CBT. For those of you, probably many have heard of mindfulness and probably many have, have also perhaps engaged in it or taken a course, but the um, probably the most popular definition is by John Kabat-Zinn. And he defines it as the awareness that emerges from paying attention to something in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So what does that mean? <laughs> so if I were to, as I'm sitting here talking, if I were to try and be mindful right in this moment, I would be pulling my attention into, you know, perhaps where I'm seated, the, the feel of my feet on the ground. And very quickly while I'm doing that, I might, my mind might be jumping to, oh my goodness, how much time do I have left in this presentation? Uh, I have to do something tomorrow. And what mindfulness encourages us to do is to simply notice that your mind wandered off because that's what our minds do. It's very normal for that to happen. And just because it wandered off doesn't mean you can't do it. I often have people say, oh, I, you know, my mind's all over the place. I can't do this. And that's actually very normal. But all you want to do is simply notice that you're thinking about something else and then bring it back, whether it's to the feel of your feet on the ground or your breath. And it's just that idea that you're sort of taking a little bit of time to bring yourself right to the here and now. Andy Puttycomb, he's the founder of an app. Some of you may have heard of this it's quite popular Headspace. Uh, it's a meditation app and there are many, many out there. But he said, most people assume that meditation is all about stopping thoughts, getting rid of emotions, somehow controlling the mind. But actually it's about stepping back, seeing the thought clearly, and then just witnessing it coming and going without reacting and also without judging it. The, the non-judgmental uh, piece is, is really important because our natural tendency is to get frustrated, to think, oh, forget this, I can't do it. Um, but they would encourage you to not judge it. Now, in terms of the mindful, mindfulness literature, literature, I know this is very busy, you're not meant to, to read uh, all of this slide, but it's just to show that the literature in terms of mindfulness meditation has really exploded. And it, it continues to grow, but it's shown possible benefits for things like stress, anxiety, depression, pain, fatigue, sleep, even attention, so even cognitive skills. Uh, have shown improvement uh, in people who have um, started to engage in a regular mindfulness practice. And this includes people with, uh, with brain injury. Uh, interestingly, they've also done studies uh, looking at uh, actual brain changes. So for example, doing MRIs of individuals prior to them engaging in an eight week mindfulness based stress reduction uh, course where they're doing meditation for about 45 minutes a day for, for two months. And um, again, it's a great example of neuroplasticity, which is, which is the ability for our brain to change with what we, depending on what we do. Uh, and the good thing about this is that it seems to have positive effects in terms of helping us to become less reactive and, you know, so people might ask, well, why, why would you do this? Like, what's, what's the point? <laughs> um, and I, I like this, you know, this one quote, um, Michelle de Montaigne, who was a French philosopher who said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which have never happened. So, you know, which, you know, again, some people may be able to relate to that, you know, those that especially that worry a lot, where a lot of your time is spent in your head, worrying, catastrophizing, ruminating about things to come. And what happens when you're doing that all the time is you miss things, you may miss good things that might be happening around you, uh, because you're distracted by all of this, you know, all of these thoughts. So what mindfulness can do is actually teach us to be less reactive and, and be able to respond more mindfully. This <clears throat> picture below is Viktor Frankl, who was a, a Holocaust survivor and um, Austrian psychologist. And he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So 
with ongoing mindfulness practice, it allows people that pause when we're, you know, not mindful, when we are very highly stressed, you probably notice you tend to be more reactive. The, the best example I have, I think, is of driving and, and all of the road rage that goes on. And I think it's especially common right now in, in Toronto anyway. Um, but I, I remember back to a mindfulness um, practice and, and a, a client we had in the group who had a lot of road rage and, uh, you know, was quite skeptical of this eventually. But that ended up being his measure of the success. He started meditating 20 minutes a day and you know, a few weeks later came in and said, I'm, I'm honking less, I'm yelling less while I'm in the car. So it's just that ability to pause and respond versus, versus reacting. So, I mean, I think another benefit of, uh, and I just realized I've gone way over time, um, of being mindful um, is, can you relate to being mindless uh, where you've driven past your exit, you've missed your subway stop um, because you're, you know, you're not in the presence. So it can also help with cognitive uh, skills. And I realize how behind I am. So I am going to skip through very quickly um, because a lot of this stuff is in the resource section. Um, this in terms of mindfulness, in terms of where you can find um, groups and how you can sign up. Um, and I think I'm going to actually leave it there. I was also going to, there's a YouTube video at the end, watch it, you'll have the, the link and you can uh, watch that at home. Uh, and then the final thing that I was just gonna suggest as well as peer support. So it can really be helpful. Uh, it's something that we have heard uh, repeatedly when we first started this series and we ran in-person workshops, um, that was one of the things we most often heard was that people really benefited from being able to realize they weren't the only one. And there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of resources in that regard. So I will just wrap up there. And um, yeah, addressing each symptom, uh, know that there are treatments out there and just starting, starting small. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Leslie, that was uh, a wonderful talk. You reminded us to be mindful. <laughs> and uh, with that, I will ask people to send us your questions by uh, putting them in the chat. Uh, no, I'm sorry, put them in the Q&A section that you see at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and then when you finish typing in the question, push enter and we'll get it. So here we have um, a reminder about upcoming sessions. Don't forget next week is actually two weeks from tonight. Again, is Dr. Abe Snyderman, Drugs for Neuropsychiatric Symptoms of Concussion as a uh, reminder and that we run until May the 30th and then break for the summer. So. Christian, how do I see the questions in the chat? So if you hover to the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says Q&A. Okay, let's see if I can find that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't, let me know. You might just have to press the more button instead. Yeah, I don't see it. Okay, do you see a button that says more and has kind of like a ellipses icon? I see plus. I see, no, I've got something else occupying the bottom of my screen. Maybe if I reduce the size. No, I can't do that. I can I can see them if you want me to just. Okay, why don't you, re why don't you do the, it, Leslie? I know yes. we're, yeah. Um, Let's see. So we had some, since my concussion, my brain has changed. My brain itself seems to hurt more when there is a stressor. Can you talk about this? Um, that's a tough one. Dr. Tatter may want to, I'm not sure if you mean when you say your brain itself hurts more. Um, I guess I'm thinking headache. Yeah, um, I would think 
I would think headache too, if you are thinking hard, like you're using energy. When, you, when you're thinking yeah. hard, you are using energy to make those connections, to search your memory, for example, or if you're emotional about it, that is using up energy and that can produce a headache. So deep thought actually yeah. can produce a headache. Yeah, so absolutely. Perhaps you should just cool it a little bit. Or what do you think, Leslie? How would you? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I, I would suggest. I mean, it's when I, when I was talking about the energy conservation, the pacing, and this is often the case. I think, you know, people just try and, and just jump back into their old way of doing things. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, sitting at the computer, you know, we spend a lot of time or a lot of people spend a lot of time on screens these days. And so it's, it's really important to kind of try and make sure that you're doing things gradually. And I would say that if, if you notice that, you know, after you've done something and, and you're, you're feeling pain, you know, this is a time where you, you maybe want to track your symptoms a little bit and just know, you know, how long was I on? How long was I doing this? Or is it happening at the same time of the day? Um, you know, is there, a, is there a better time of the day, for example, to, uh, to do tasks that are more challenging? Do I have more energy in the morning versus later in the, the afternoon or the evening? Um, so, you know, when we're stressed, it's true. I mean, we are, it, it just, we're less resilient in, in many ways. And that's why, you know, the, the techniques that I was discussing, uh, tonight, especially the mindfulness, I think, um, or, or a combination of the, the both, but certainly mindfulness in terms of, uh, is, you know, helpful in terms of sort of damping down, uh, the activity of our nervous system, you know, often post concussion and especially if there's been a trauma, you know, people are really can be kind of on edge and, and that can, you know, when you think back to that diagram that I was showing, you know, even if we're having pain, let's say you're having a headache, if you're then having, if there are a lot of environmental stressors that are surrounding that, then the pain may actually end up feeling worse. So you might want to try, try out some of those strategies to see if it helps. I think everybody should learn how to meditate. I meditate yeah. and I can cool my brain off by meditating, especially if I'm having trouble getting to sleep. If I've, I've had a very busy day or traumatic day. If I cool my brain off by meditating, it works wonders. I just yeah. feel differently. I can get to sleep, for example. Yeah, yeah, it really, I think, has tremendous benefit you know I think you know and it again it doesn't even have to be a long um, meditation and and even just during your day even just simple relaxation exercise exercises breathing just doing you know shutting things down for a couple of minutes and doing some deep breathing uh, can really you know help to calm down our, our physiology so um, so maybe try that um, someone else is asking, how do you access this resource, the Tele Rehab Center for ABI at Toronto Rehab? So this is um, uh, in Dr. Robin Green's lab uh, at Toronto Rehab, and they have been up and running uh, for several years now and have, uh, it's, it's all free group support. Uh, it started out, it was just for traumatic brain injury, and it's now they have expanded. And they, uh, and initially, it was for moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, but they now do take individuals with concussions. So ET groups, they offer mindfulness groups, they offer something called goal management training, uh, which is helpful if you're having some problems with with cognitive functioning. Um, at the end of the presentation, I actually included, you do require a referral from your uh, physician, uh, and those can be faxed to the number on the form. So that's also in the, um, at the end of the presentation. So uh, is, you know, another uh, uh, potential support. Um, just on, on the group front, uh, I noted, uh, I think it was in the, uh, 
the chat that Anne had indicated the Concussion Legacy Foundation offers support groups for people with persistent symptoms. Uh, and then there's also, uh, you know, in terms of more local ones, the Ontario Brain Injury Association has peer support uh, available. Check out your local brain injury uh, associations. I know the, the Brain Injury Society of Toronto has uh, different types of groups. So, um, so those can be helpful. I mean, I think you, you always want to be uh, careful. It's not to say every single group is uh, helpful. I have heard, you know, there are sometimes, sometimes groups can be more negatively oriented. I don't think that's helpful for anyone. You really want to have uh, a group that is, you know, focused on um, strategies and, and symptoms and, and sharing um, of information. So there, again, those there's resources that are listed in the, uh, the references. Leslie, I can now see the questions. It just, oh, can they, you? Okay, they, great. They have appeared on my screen. Excellent. So the next question is, are there any apps or games that are useful and free and are good for improving neuroplasticity? Yeah, that's, that's a, a tough that's a, question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are tons of apps out there. Uh, and, and I have listed uh, some in, in the reference section. Um, I mean, there are online brain games. And I think there's nothing wrong with, with you know, doing those. I think it's important to know that you don't need to do a brain game on a computer to help your brain. So what we know about neuroplasticity is, you know, the best thing that you can do is to change things up, to try and learn new things. So not doing the same thing, you know, every day, somebody will say, oh, I'm doing Sudoku's every day. Well, that's great, but you also want to be, you know, doing, doing something more, something that's going to require your brain to shift a little bit. Um, so, you know, Lumosity, you may, some people may have heard of, and I think they got themselves in a bit of trouble um, years ago because they were claiming, I think that it, I'm not sure exactly what the claim was, maybe that your, your brain uh, grows bigger or something like that. But um, uh, so there's, there's nothing to say that there's anything wrong with, with any of, of the apps and, and games that are out there. Um, you know, there are apps for, there's apps for everything these days. There's apps for, uh, there's actually cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So if you're having sleep difficulties, there's actually sort of a uh, CBT that has been specifically designed for that. Uh, there's all kinds of mindfulness apps. Um, many have some free uh, components and then often their larger paid component. Insight Timer is one that has a lot of free content on it. Um, in terms of meditations, so thousands and thousands of meditations, ranging anywhere from a minute to you know hours long, so you really can go in and, and search around and find what you want. So, yeah. The next question, Leslie, is from Dr. John Rizos, who's a very well respected sports medicine doctor who knows a lot, um, and he's asking. Does Dr. Rattan have a reference that examines meditation for concussion symptoms? Yeah, and I've included some of those that are just sort of screenshotted, but I can I can certainly send those to you as well, uh, Dr. Rizos. And thank you. I've seen you on a number of times, so it's it's nice to see you back. And Karen Bursch, thank you, Leslie. Very informative. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Teresa Wonder, no question. Your lecture was inspiring and informative. Only wish you did not run out of time. <laughs> okay, Teresa, thank you. And then an anonymous question. Post-concussion, I've had panic attacks, which never happened prior to concussion. Is this unusual? How best to deal with these? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I'm really sorry to hear that. That's it's actually not unusual. Um, individuals, you know, I've definitely seen many people who have who have experienced panic attacks post concussion. Uh, I think, you know, seeking out professional help 
uh, is, is really important. It's not unusual for someone having a panic attack. Uh, you know, it's a very, very unpleasant experience. If people are having a full-blown panic attack, they feel, they feel as if they're dying. So they often end up in the emergency room um, only to learn that there's, they're actually fine physically, um, but they may have thought that they were having a heart attack or, or something bad was about to happen. So I think, you know, if, if you are having panic attacks, probably the first uh, point of contact is with your family physician, just to ensure um, that there's, you know, that there's nothing else uh, going on and to actually get a, a solid diagnosis of panic and then to uh, to get a referral to someone who specializes in, in panic, uh, panic disorder. Leslie, are you okay if I add to that? Sure, yes. So I've recently been paying a lot of attention to PTSD, which is the post-traumatic stress disorder, but it really does include panic attacks in most people who have it. I am amazed at how common it is when, when we ask about it. Have you had, for example, crash nightmares? I find especially after motor vehicle crashes, people are reliving the crash during the day or even having crash nightmares at night, like going to sleep feeling very, fairly well. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the night, they wake up with a nightmare, which includes reliving the crash. And I agree completely with Leslie that they can be helped. And often it does require involvement of your family doctor or even a psychiatrist mm -hmm. to recommend the appropriate medication if non-medicinal measures don't work. Uh, it's amazing how how effective medication is for those people with panic attacks. So mm -hmm. there's help for you out there one way or another. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And certainly with if if there is trauma involved in and in, and in post traumatic stress disorder, then yes, again, you're going to want to um, yeah referral to a psychiatrist or a neuropsychiatrist uh, and you know, and probably some combination of medication and, and trauma-focused therapy would be, would be the best bet. Dan Khalil is, uh, is um, making a comment. I tried meditating in the morning. It helped for a while, but I found it difficult to keep it going. If I do some slow stretching and concentrate on the, on the body, will this be effective as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I always say to people, because some people do, you know, they prefer, there are all kinds of ways that we can be, that we can meditate. I mean, we can be mindful anytime we can be walking around, we can uh, be doing the dishes, we can be brushing our teeth. As far as meditating, yeah, absolutely. Um, in the mindfulness-based stress reduction courses, often they, they have a variety of meditations. There's often usually a, one that's a body scan, which typically is done lying down where you're sort of moving through different parts of your body, uh, a sitting one, but there's usually also one that's just sort of a gentle yoga. So just stretching and, and exactly concentrating on your body and sort of being mindful. So I, absolutely, I, I think there's not, nothing wrong with that at, at all. I think that's, that's a great alternative. Here's a really tough one. Is there any research about tinnitus at the moment? I got it after my concussion six years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. It's definitely not my area of expertise. And I will say that we've had experts talking about this. Um, so you can find the talks on all of these different topics on our, on our website. Um, Dr. Tatter, do you want to comment on? Well, I would add just to what you were saying that it's Dr. John Rutka who mentioned tinnitus in his talks and he's he's an expert on um, the uh, hearing effects of concussion and the dizziness effects and I can say that there just hasn't been a breakthrough in that some people do benefit from noise cancellation um, hearing aids, 
but uh, you know, you could see an audiologist, you could see an ear, nose, and throat doctor to make sure there's that that it doesn't mean something else. But there are a lot of patients with with concussion and tinnitus, and we have not been able to make uh, a difference for them, unfortunately. Um, here's another question. I suffered an MVA almost four years ago. I've attended two group sessions and some psychotherapy. I'm still having all the symptoms, like you mentioned, PTSD, panic, anxiety, always feeling not getting enough air in my lungs. I do yoga, exercises, still seems a long way to go. What other resources would help? Well, that's a mm. toughie, Dr. It is. it is, because it sounds, it sounds, Anna, like you're doing, you know, you're doing a lot of all of those non- pharmacological strategies that we're talking about. So I, I would wonder if you might consider uh, getting a referral uh, to a, a psychiatrist to, to see if there might be, or, or speaking with your, you know, speaking with your family doctor first um, about the possibility. You didn't mention medication, but as Dr. Tatter said, sometimes um, medication in conjunction with the things that, uh, that you're mentioning, um, can can be helpful. Here's a great comment from a, from a listener. Meditation and breathing practice are like getting to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. Uh, that's <laughs> yes, <great>. indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for so that. True. I agree with that. And here's another question. How does one deal with the stress that dealing with WSIB or other insurance gives you? Uh, what a great question. <laughs> over I wish, you, I, wish I had a good attend. answer. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, honestly, it's, it's really difficult. And it's been, you know, it's, it's very frustrating as a healthcare provider as well, um, because I see it in, in the, the patients and, and the clients that I see, you know, we may be making gains and then a letter comes or a call comes from the insurance company, which, you know, ends up setting people back. Um, you know, I, you know, I think, la yeah. Leslie, la last year, we did have a session planned with an insurance person and I think yes. it fell through so maybe it did. we should try hard to get someone from one of the insurance companies yeah. to come on this and answer some of these questions I think we're going to try that again yeah yeah we did try um, I mean this doesn't really answer your question but Dr. Tatter has also worked I think you know to to get people together get lawyers together people from insurance companies together healthcare providers together um, because I think a lot of the time, you know, the people on the other end don't necessarily understand um, probably what is happening on the other end. And I think, you know, hopefully more education and time may help. But, but it's, you know, I think in terms of how do you deal with it, I think it's, you know, using whatever you, strategies you can to, to help deal with any other kind of stress. Um, it's a really difficult one and, and certainly not uncommon because it's something that we hear frequently. Here's a question from Carrie Simon McMillan. Where does the difference in diagnosis lie between a concussion versus a TBI? Would your suggestion today be more or less supportive if you, if you are diagnosed with one versus the other? So you first, Leslie. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, and, and this is where confusion sometimes sets in, I think, with um, just with the terminology. So concussion actually is a TBI, and it's sometimes referred to as a, a mild TBI. Some people prefer that term and other people prefer concussion, but it is a brain injury. They're all brain injuries. And in terms of the difference in diagnosis, you know, the difference between, a, a con for example, having a concussion and having a severe traumatic injury there are different criteria that we look at. For example, you know, how long was someone unconscious for? Did they have any, you know, when, when they were looked at on a, a CT scan, their brain was looked at, there was, there was bleeding, there were contusions, um, 
that kind of thing. So it's it's really kind of on a continuum and, and concussion is at one and, and severe is on the other, but that doesn't mean, as I've heard Dr. Tatter say many times, just, you know, a concussion can also lead to very, you know, disruptive and, and severe symptoms. So, um, and then I'll just say in terms of the suggestions that I made today, they would be the same, whether um, uh, it was a severe TBI. In fact, we had run a study years ago uh, with um, individuals with more severe traumatic brain injury, providing cognitive behavioral therapy by telephone um, to individuals around the province and found you know, that, that it's helpful for them as well. So um, that's why you know, in the tele-rehab center that I was referring to as well, they're using CBT mindfulness with, with the whole range of traumatic brain injury from, from you know, concussion to severe. I think Dr. Tatter will add to that. Yes, I um, completely agree with uh, Leslie that the it's a spectrum, but the treatments are are almost identical. And um, I actually prefer the word concussion because I there's nothing mild about uh, a concussion. So why call it a mild? TBI. So I like the word concussion better. Sometimes people with advanced forms of brain injury will have identifiable areas of damage on a CAT scan or on an MRI, whereas in concussion, they are completely normal. So that's one way of differentiating them. But in terms of symptoms, they're, they're very close. And I think we're going to have to end off there because we're past our time. Mm -hmm. But I do want to provide um, Dr. Rattan, especially um, with this final comment from Rick and Mary. Thank you. You are so helpful and down to earth. Uh, what a lovely way to oh, end off. And thank you so much, Dr. Rattan. Um, thank you. In final comment, I'd like to um, ask you to fill out a short survey that we will be sending to you by email so that we can obtain some feedback. You've already given us very good feedback, but any other thoughts that you have would be most uh, appreciated. And um, just as a reminder, again, our next session is in two weeks, uh, April the 4th on a Tuesday at 6 p.m. And the speaker will be Dr. Abe Snyderman. So you'll have a chance to ask some of the questions that you asked tonight to someone who's even more knowledgeable about some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms of concussion. And that is the, the title of his topic, Drugs for Neuropsychiatric Symptoms of Concussion. So thank you to Christian for organizing yeah. tonight. Thank you for uh, all the great questions from the audience. And thank you, Leslie, for your wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Have a good night.